When it comes to the all-time craziest and most unbelievable true stories ever committed to celluloid, Sidney Lumet's Dog Day Afternoon tops the list. Ripped right from the headlines, the stranger-than-fiction true crime story about three men attempting to rob a bank during broad daylight in the dead of summer in New York only to become a grueling 14-hour hostage situation and high-profile media circus will forever live in infamy due to how incredibly outlandish the details are. While the names of the primary players have been changed for the big screen adaptation, and while many fascinating tidbits about the case were slightly altered or omitted for the final film, the overwhelming majority of what transpires in Dog Day Afternoon really happened on one sweltering summer day in August 1972. Come closer, y'all. It's time to separate the wheat from the chaff and find out what the f really happened to Dog Day Afternoon. First, the basic premise. Directed by Sidney Lumet from a script by Frank Pearson, Dog Day Afternoon attempts to recreate with great accuracy the real-life bank robbery attempt that took place in Brooklyn on August 22, 1972. Based on the Life magazine article The Boys in the Bank by P.F. Klug and Thomas Moore, the movie traces a 27-year-old first-time criminal named Sonny Wurtzik, played by Al Pacino, who recruits two accomplices to help him rob a first Brooklyn savings bank, changed from Chase Manhattan. Sonny's two crime partners include 18-year-old Salvatore Naturali, played by John Cazelli, and 20-year-old Stevie, played by Gary Springer. Interestingly, of the three criminals, only Salvatore Naturali's name remained authentic in the film. Sonny Wurtzik is based on real-life criminal John Wojtovich, and Stevie is based on John's real-life accomplice, Bobby Westenberg. Intending to be a quick grab-and-go robbery, Sonny and Sal are left on their own when Stevie gets cold feet and flees the scene just as the holdup gets underway. This really happened to Bobby Westenberg, who successfully escaped the bank before the throng of police officers arrived at the scene. However, he was later arrested for his involvement in the crime. Trapped inside with nine hostages, Sonny begins to negotiate his demands with Police Sergeant Eugene Moretti, played by Charles Durning, and reveals his motive for the robbery, to pay for his boyfriend's gender reassignment surgery. Having fallen into a suicidal despondency over the inability to afford a sex change operation, Sonny believed his lover would take his own life if he didn't obtain enough money to pay for the procedure and become a woman. In the film, Sonny's boyfriend is named Leon Shermer, played by Chris Sarandon. However, in real life, Sonny's partner was named Ernest Aaron, who identified as a woman named Elizabeth, Liz Eden. As for Sergeant Moretti, he was based on the real-life NYPD police chief of detectives, Louis C. Cotel. On August 22, 1972, John, Sal, and Bobby stormed into a Chase Manhattan bank at 450 Avenue P in Gravesend, Brooklyn at 3 o'clock p.m. After receiving a tip from a Chase executive while frequenting a gay bar, Wurtzik expected to score somewhere between 150 grand and 200 grand in cash that was to be delivered to the branch at roughly 3.30 p.m. However, as depicted in the film, the robbers were enraged to learn that the armored truck had already picked up the money at 11 a.m. that day. In the film, the robbers managed to secure a mere $1,100. In reality, they scored 29 grand from the teller's cash boxes and roughly 175 grand more in traveler's checks. Upon John's arrest, he was charged with stealing a total of $213,000. After realizing the heist had gone awry, Bobby fled the scene just before the police arrived and cordoned the bank, forcing John and Sal to hole up inside. The two men proceeded to hold nine bank employees hostage for an uninterrupted 14 hours. As police surrounded the area, media outlets fanned the flames of hysteria while hundreds of rabid spectators gathered around the bank in the sweaty summer heat as the holdup continued. All this remains faithful in the film. As depicted in the film, the police cut the power to the building which shut off the lights inside the bank. What isn't shown is that John nearly shot off his toe in the dark 
while futzing with the fuse box after the lights were cut. When these additional shots rang out, bank teller Josephine Titino initially believed John had shot bank manager Robert Barrett. As it is, Sonny fires a single shot in the film upon warning Moretti with a rifle round through the back window as the officer approaches. Among John's list of hostage demands to the police included releasing his boyfriend Ernie Aaron from Kings County Hospital, delivering Coca-Cola, hamburgers, and three pizzas, delivered by a pizza boy in the film but the FBI in real life, providing transportation to JFK Airport and fueling up a jet plane to take them and the hostages to a safe and secure destination of his choosing. These demands were largely kept intact for the final film, but were also slightly embellished. In the film, Sonny demands that his wife Angie, with whom he has two children, be brought to the bank, but that never occurred in real life. Neither did the instance in which Sonny is seen waving a handkerchief to signal the police upon exiting the bank. According to Whitevich, he would never have done this in real life because he would have considered such a gesture a means of surrender. In the end, Sal is fatally shot in the forehead, and Sonny is arrested while the hostages are released unharmed. Ultimately, Sonny was arrested and given a 20-year jail sentence in the film, but Wojtovich served just six years before his real-life release. Another major difference between the film and reality was the age and physical makeup of Sal Naturale. In real life, Naturale was just 18 years old at the time of the bank robbery. In the film, the character was played by John Cazelli, who was 39 years old when filming commenced. Sidney Lumet initially balked at casting such an old actor for the part, but was convinced by Cazelli within the first five minutes of meeting him in person and offered him the role on the spot. An additional discrepancy between the facts of the case and the fictional account of the film is the conversation Sonny has with his mother outside of the bank. This did not occur in real life and was entirely fabricated for the film. Also, Wurtzik had gone on record saying that the portrayal of his ex-wife, Carmen, Angie in the film, was grossly inaccurate. He was roundly denied that he left his wife for Aaron, as suggested in the film, adamantly stating that he separated from his wife two years before he met Aaron. To Wojtovich's chagrin, the film portrays Sonny's wife as a plain, overweight gnat, and the sole reason he left to be with Leon. While Sonny is seen speaking with Angie in the film, Wojtovich claims that the police never actually let him speak with his wife Carmen during the real 14-hour event. But the single biggest difference between the film and real-life events is the motive of the robbery and subsequent payment of Aaron's sex change operation. In the film, after Sonny speaks with his mother, he goes back inside the bank and begins dictating his will. Sonny stipulates that the money from the bank robbery and his life insurance policy is intended to pay for Leon's, Aaron, reassignment surgery. According to reports, this was not the primary motive for the robbery, and Sonny was really conducting a well-planned mafia robbery for the notorious Gambino crime family that backfired gloriously. Whatever the true motive, Wojtovich felt the sex change motive was exaggerated in the film. Moreover, the end of the film states that Leon went ahead with the reassignment surgery and lived for the rest of her days as a woman until her death from AIDS in 1987. What the movie doesn't state is how her operation was funded not by the robbery money, but by the payment Wojtovich received for selling his rights for cinematic adaptation. While Westenberg was offered $2,000 for his rights to the story, he was in the middle of a two-year jail sentence for the crime and settled on a paltry $750. In comparison, Wojtovich was paid $7,500 for the rights to his story along with 1% of the movie's net worth, with 2,500 specifically set aside for Eden's operation. Producer Martin Bregman has denied that his company Artists Entertainment Complex agreed to give Wojtovich a percentage point. He did agree to give Wojtovich 25 grand if the film performed better than Serpico at the box office, which it did by more than 20 million. When Wojtovich sued the studio for 1% of the film's grosses that he was promised, he was awarded 40 grand 
after the lawyer's fees were subtracted. Speaking of Eden, another glaring difference between the movie and the real-life case is the photo of the character used on television. During the actual standoff, TV news aired footage of John's unofficial marriage ceremony to Eden that took place in 1971, which featured an excessive amount of patrons dressed in drag and engaging in all sorts of drunken debauchery. Considering the footage to be too over-the-top risque and fearful that it would alienate audiences, Lumet decided to exclude the wedding footage from the film and simply show a still image of Eden dressed in a white wedding gown. Of course, one of the things the movie translated from the Life article was the strange relationship between the robbers and the hostages, many of whom began to develop a certain Stockholm Syndrome while inside the bank. This was genuinely the case, as Wojtovich exuded an inclusive, playful sense of humor during the 14-hour holdup that encouraged the hostages to fraternize with the two crooks. After the incident, bank manager Robert Barrett went on record saying, I'm supposed to hate those guys, but I've had more laughs tonight than I've had in weeks. As depicted in the film with his surrogate character Mulvaney, Barrett really went into diabetic shock once nightfall hit. He also really refused to be escorted out of the hostage situation by police and gallantly stayed inside the bank with his employees for the duration. Now, just as interesting as the disparity between fact and fiction in the film is the unbelievable aspects of the true story that were omitted from the film entirely. For instance, on the day of the robbery, Wojtovich went to see The Godfather in a Times Square movie theater. The thief was so inspired by the Francis Ford Coppola crime classic that Wojtovich even scrawled the iconic line, this is an offer you can't refuse, on the ransom note during the bank robbery conducted just hours later. Of course, the grand irony is that The Godfather stars Al Pacino and John Cazelli. Another insane factoid that was left out of the film was the bumbling series of botched attempts to rob several banks shortly before hitting Chase Manhattan. While the exact timeline is unclear, the three men attempted to rob a bank in Manhattan's Lower East Side. However, as they were entering the bank, one of the men dropped a shotgun that accidentally went off in the street. The crowd of shocked onlookers forced the trio to immediately flee. Later, an attempt to rob a bank in Queens Howard Beach was dashed upon recognizing one of their mother's close friends as they were unholstering their firearms. Yet a third robbery attempted was scrapped when upon doing a test run in Manhattan, their getaway car crashed into another vehicle. What the f indeed? One more sordid detail omitted from the film is what transpired the night before the robbery. The three men stayed at a New Jersey hotel, where Wojtovich offered Westenberg 50 grand for his services in the heist. Apparently, Wojtovich wanted services of a different kind as well. We went to the Golden Nugget Motel the night before the robbery, says Wojtovich. While we're in there, I grabbed a hold of Bobby Westenberg and I wanted to f him, cause he used to dress up as a girl with a dress, right? And he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, I want to f you. Well, I don't want you f me, I said. I'm giving you 50 grand, right? You're telling me I'm not going to get a f out of it? You're out of your f mind because I'm getting a f out of this. And then I f him. And then Sal came over and he wanted to f Bobby. Bobby tells him no. So they start getting into a fight. So I come out of the shower and I said, hey, what are you two bitches arguing about? We could die tomorrow. Let's die happy. While the heart and soul of the film are expressed in the emotionally moving telephone conversation between Sonny and Leon in the film, a real-life phone call that took place between John and New York Daily News reporter Robert Capstatter during the standoff was left out of the film. According to Capstatter, my editor said, Start working the story by phone. See what you can get. So I said, I'll call the bank. So I called the bank and lo and behold, this guy... Wojtovich picks up the phone and says he's one of the bandits. He's giving these great quotes. I say, are you afraid of dying? Could you really kill these people? I'm sitting there listening to this, taking notes, typing like crazy, and my mind is going, wow, what a story. What a story indeed. Of course, one luxury the film didn't have is for telling the future regarding the bizarre Wojtovich saga. 
Following the real-life robbery, Wojtovich was sentenced to 20 years in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. While he ended up only serving six years of his sentence, his life took a turn for the worse. While in jail, many of Wojtovich's fellow inmates became outraged over the perception that he sold out Aaron by publicly airing his business and profiting off the movie rights. As such, Wojtovich was brutally gang-raped in prison and ended up in the hospital for his injuries and had post-traumatic nightmares for years afterward. Wojtovich responded by adamantly arranging for Dog Day Afternoon to be screened in prison so his inmates could see his side of the story. Following John's arrest, Aaron accepted the money, used it for his gender reassignment surgery, and lived the rest of her days as Liz Eden. However, Liz disowned Wojtovich after the surgery, claiming that she never wanted to see him again. As a result, John slipped into a suicidal funk and slit his wrists but ultimately survived. Fortunately, John found a ray of hope by meeting and marrying fellow inmate George Heath, both of whom were released from jail in 1978. Afterward, the two lived with Wojtovich's mother in Brooklyn. In a gimmicky attempt to capitalize on his celebrity, Wojtovich would often make appearances outside of the Chase Manhattan Bank location on Avenue P to sign autographs and sell pictures for years following the movie's release. He even tried and failed to get a job as a security guard at the same bank, saying of the incident, I went to Chase Manhattan when I was first out of the halfway house, and I wanted to be a security guard. My reference was Dog Day Afternoon. I says, I'm the guy from Dog Day Afternoon, and if I'm guarding your bank, nobody's going to rob the dog's bank. Unfortunately, John Wojtovich passed away from cancer in his mother's apartment on January 2nd, 2006. He was 60 years old. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what the f*** really happened to Dog Day Afternoon. Aside from a few key altered details and factual omissions, Sidney Lumet went through painstaking efforts to authentically recreate the unbelievable true story that transpired on August 22nd, 1972. Stranger than fiction, indeed.